Uh, so welcome to a Longwood's discuss, leadership discussion. Is our health system ready for where science is taking us? To lead us through today's discussion, you will all be familiar with this well-known Canadian medical and health journalist. Without further delay, Avis Favreau. Avis, all yours. Thank you very much, Matt. And hello to everyone across the country. Thank you for joining us. And the way we're going to phrase this is that we're talking about the dawn of living medicines. Uh, and, you know, when I started my health career, health journalism career many years ago, like 40, um, this was talked about, but it's actually at the doorstep. And I've started doing stories on it and it's fascinating and it's so interesting. So this session really is how do doctors and health systems and hospitals and provinces start to deal with these new therapies because they're coming. Um, these are not pills and medications in the traditional sense. This is a new kind of thinking because we're talking about cell-based therapies, plural. And there's two particular kind that you're going to be hearing about today. One is the ones that fix defective or missing genes. And those are for diseases like thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. And then there are the cell therapies and those are engineered. They take the cells from the patient, tweak them, reprogram them, put them back in the patient so that they then target the disease or cancer. And the one you'll be hearing about today is something called CAR-T. So you'll learn that term today. So I found out that there are some 27 gene and cell-based therapies approved in the US and in Europe. I think there are about 12 in Canada, but what's important is that there are some 2000 more being worked on in labs around the world. And just a couple of weeks ago, the New England Journal published a very exciting study. There's a lot of talk of it online that showed that that one cell therapy called CART-T therapy was possibly promising in autoimmune diseases like lupus. That is a huge new area. And so what do we do with this? How do you prepare? Um, because these therapies will be different. It could be that just one, a single one-time treatment could replace the burden of illness and all the healthcare costs for some of these diseases. So. We are joined today by four experts in different fields to talk about these emerging tools, and you're going to learn a lot. From Calgary, we'll be joined by Dean Duffin, father and a cancer care advocate. Dean hasn't joined us yet, but we know he'll show up. From Toronto, Dr. Elise Aon, a researcher and physician from the Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences at SickKids Hospital in Toronto, and an expert on gene therapy and their use in retinal eye diseases. Hi, Dr. Aon. Hi, thank you. From Hamilton, Dr. Ronan Foley, a clinical hematologist at the Jurovinsky Cancer Center who treats patients with blood cancers with those CAR-T therapies you'll be hearing about. Hi, Dr. Foley. And from Toronto, Dr. Bob Bell, former Ontario Deputy Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and the former president and CEO of University Health Network, who's going to talk about the big picture of how do you introduce these brand new therapies, some of them with eye-watering price tags, like $2 million per patient, uh, but with potential life-sparing benefits. So, we'll be talking about effectiveness, availability across the country, and what frontline doctors are seeing as they start using these therapies, along with some tips for how to move this along more quickly, because there will be a demand. So we're going to, since Dean hasn't joined us yet, we're going to go to Dr. Aon at the Hospital for Sick Children. We met a few years ago doing a story on gene therapy yeah. for retinal eye yeah. diseases. And at that point, it was so exciting. It wasn't so approved, yeah. It wasn't approved, uh, but mm -hmm. so tell me now how the cell therapies for eye diseases are changing the way you practice. Thank you, Avis. So cell therapies currently are not integrated in our practice, but are studied uh, extensively. And cell therapies, unlike the CAR-T that Dr. Foley is going to talk about, for us is to replace a tissue. Like a lot of people hear about the stem cell therapy where we can manipulate the cells to become 
uh, for example, a retina specific cells to replace a missing piece of retina where there's a scar, for example, like macular degeneration. The challenge with the cell therapy for us is the integration of the cell in the rest of the tissue. But it's progressing very fast. It's progressing very fast. Are, the gene... you, sorry, sorry. are you starting to use it in patients in an experimental way? Not us at SickKids. And uh, it's tested in some clinical trials, mostly for older patients uh, for macular degeneration. Uh, but it's evolving quickly. It's evolving quickly. There's been no adverse event, which is which is great. The only challenge is the retina is like a microchip, and the challenge is the the neural reconnections, and so that's what people are working on. So it's okay. only at the or very early clinical trial level. All right. So what kind of diseases that people would be listening to would these apply to? Macular degeneration. What what other ones? Yeah, any any condition, for example, advanced retinitis pigmentosa, where the retina has died mostly. So anywhere where there's a loss of tissue. So it's not macular degeneration is sort of the poster child because there's a scar in the center of retina. But that feature exists in many other retinal diseases, even in children. So you can have macular degeneration in children. And so cell therapy for us is going to be for those conditions, or sometimes the cells can also be used to deliver a treatment, to deliver a drug. And that's also being explored at the very early stages. Now, have you treated some children with some of the early treatments? We have not treated with cell therapy, but we've treated with gene therapy, with gene replacement therapy, where a, a cause of vision loss, for example, retinitis pigmentosa, is due to a missing gene. So there's a missing function. So if it's like a missing syllable in, in a sentence, so then the sentence makes no sense and there's no product at the end. So if you can replace the missing gene and reinstate function, then the machinery can start working again. And we've been doing this uh, publicly funded for nearly a year. Uh, at the Hospital for Sick Children in Sunnybrook, where there's a cause of vision loss due to a defect in the RP65 mm -hmm. gene. And I tell you, it's been life-changing for the patients, for the families, and for us as physicians, because we don't often have the privilege of offering something that really makes a difference. And seeing kids that have now recovered sight in the dark, usually those children, they have very poor central sight, but they can't see anything when you transition from a bright to a dim environment, they lose everything. So at night, they can't function on their own and so on. And now they're bicycling at night, they're doing Halloween, and the parents don't need to chaperone them everywhere. So it has massive impact on their confidence and how the adolescents and young adults just pursue their journey with enthusiasm. Uh, it's been really an incredible story. How do you feel when you see that? Oh, it's like we cried the first time, like the whole team, like we just, we just cried with the family. And every case that we do, I get the goosebumps. I get the goosebumps just talking about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's a wonderful progression of medicine. It's a new era of medicine. You mentioned it's on the doorstep. I like that sentence. But for us, it's in the house. So we need the discussions have to change. The discussions have to change in terms of risk benefits because they're interventions. And in terms of expectations, they're not cures, they're treatments. And that's also something to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, when we talk about it, how do you deliver it? What are the mechanics of it as simply as you can put put it? The for gene the therapy. current gene therapy, for the current yeah. gene therapy, it's an intraocular procedure. So the patient needs to be put to sleep. And there's some trocars that are put in the, in the eye. And so some long needles penetrate the eyeball to reach the retina, which is the tissue in the back of the eye that senses the light. And the medication is injected under the retina, hoping that enough healthy cells 
are going to gobble the medication to restart the vision cycle. And usually you see an effect as early as two weeks and a significant effect uh, at one month. That's, That's quite amazing. It is. That's amazing. You mentioned to me when we were preparing for this, that some of the kids actually become naughty because they no yes. longer need their parents to shepherd them at night. So it's very interesting. The behavior of I'd say children, adolescents and adults all change because they become more confident. And often children uh, are sheltered more than others if they didn't have a visual impairment. And now that they don't need that, it's a bit of free for all. And so we tell the parents, now is the time to, to intervene. It's very interesting, the effect on everyone's personalities. Yeah. So are there, are, are there challenges for you to get these therapies to your kids? Yes. For us in ophthalmology, the biggest challenge is that very few people are aware of the prevalence of vision loss and the impact that it has on people. And even what it costs to society, a study was done recently where just looking at inherited retinal degeneration, not including uh, age-related macular degeneration and glaucoma, the cost to Canadian taxpayers is two to six billion dollars a year. And so it's not insignificant, but you don't see someone who's visually impaired, right? But it's it's a big socioeconomical problem. So for us mm -hmm. is to raise awareness, and we try to tell the patients to be vocal about their disability. And so that's also a big culture change that has to happen and educate the government and authorities, regulatory agencies about the importance of uh, a vision loss. So for us, that's been the major barrier. <laughs> All right. So I know we're starting to get questions come in, but we'll address those a little bit later. Thank you so much, Dr. Vian. You're welcome. So now um, we're going to go to Hamilton and Dr. Foley, where we're going to talk about the therapies, the cell therapies being used with cancer, and you are dealing with CAR-T therapy. So I would just want to say that CAR-T stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells, but CAR-T is much easier, isn't it, to say? Yeah. Um, when did you start using it? Do you remember your first patient? Yeah, that's a great question, Avis. It was uh, 2017 uh, that we first embarked on CAR-T cell therapy in the context of a clinical trial. We were one of two centers in Canada that that first started this. So it was obviously extremely exciting and really had beat, beat expectations. For when and this we, was when in this was in patients with leukemia who had failed all other treatments. Nothing yes. for them. Nothing for were, them. These were patients with lymphoma and leukemia who really had reached the end of hope. Um, and very little treatment options left in the time they had remaining. So this CAR-T came into the scene in that context and started to cure people. And- Did we, you say cure? Did you say cure? Well, it was I, the C we, word, yeah. Yeah, I, I think it is, I think it is that. And obviously I choose that word carefully, um, but you can imagine you know, we make a lot of advances in science. The war on cancer goes on every day in, in many ways. But just like you said, Avis, when when you start talking about cure, and remember, that's a one and done therapy. They don't need any more treatments. Life goes back to normal. That is a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. When you see that, people take notice. And so that's really been a draw to this type of therapy. Are the you results. meant... You mentioned one patient that you were uh, that you had treated seven years ago. So I guess he was in that first cohort, and you were looking for him, and you were worried because you couldn't find him. Yeah, no, he and and this this poor gentleman had had a terrible journey heading into it. Uh, lots of toxic chemo, high dose chemotherapy, um, deconditioned things not working, failure after failure, and he entered into the trial. He received a single injection of CAR T cells. By one month, he was in complete remission. And um, I, just like you said, I was I was looking for him sometime in the summer, a few years later, and I couldn't track him down. And I was terrified that something bad had happened to him because we were constantly watching these people down the road. But uh, it turned out he was at his cottage water skiing. So it made me realize these people do go back to a, a quality of life. 
How does that make you feel? Cancer is a very hard one to practice medicine in. Well, you know, I think it collect as, as part of a, a research world and a, and a clinical world. Obviously, it's it's this is the dawn of a new era, um, and, and and I think we're all very proud. Uh, look, people didn't stumble onto this. This this is the result of decades of well designed experimental research in preclinical models, initially by just a few groups, but now there's thousands of groups that are working on this. The genie is truly out of the bottle now. And, um, and, and, and so there's, there's just a lot happening in this area. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful system because, um, as, as, as you know, Avis, it creates a living drug. Uh, so it is a, a treatment that uses lymphocytes, which are very powerful parts of our immune system. They have this incredible ability to fight infections. They can expand, they can attack, and they can persist. And that's what gets exploited in the in the CAR T cell therapy. The gene therapy part of it is to create a novel synthetic receptor that specifically targets a target on a cancer cell. And that CAR T cell doesn't care what that cell is. If it has the target, it will go after it. Uh, the cells expand in the body. They're like human incubators creating these armies of cells that go on and on and on. And and the folks down in Philadelphia that where a lot of this um, science came from, uh, you know, talk about cells being there a decade later. So, so it is a living drug. It's a one and done situation. When it works, it works. And, and I will say it doesn't work in everybody. It doesn't. So what are you seeing in your clinic? How many have you treated and what's been the outcome? Uh, we've treated over 100 of patients now. Um, and, you know, the outcomes are... About 40% of people are go into remission and stay in remission. 40. And the other ones, are, you, can you give it to them again? Uh, we not, not at present. Um, in some scenarios, uh, kids with leukemia, that's been talked about, but that's, that's experimental. At, at this stage, uh, we, we can't give a, um, a second dose, but you bring up an extremely important um, part of this. And, and look, there's a lot of research going on, a lot of real world research going on to, to make this better, to improve things. And understanding why it fails may be as important as understanding why it works, just like you said. Mm -hmm. So the question would be, is there a bigger potential if you use it, not when everything else has failed, yeah. but earlier in the process? Is that so possible? Without earlier, question, yeah. yeah. Without question, the field is moving in that direction. So it's very compelling to think that earlier in the disease, um, you know, the lymphocytes are in better shape, they're fitter, they haven't been exposed to to multiple rounds of other therapies. And, you know, the jaw dropping part of this is this could work in people who literally were at the end of the line for 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 treatments. Um, and it really miraculous. Um, so, Huge potential. Um, the field is expanding rapidly, uh, and there's a lot of uh, pressures on on you know how how do we caretake this exciting, expensive, uh, but mm -hmm. but huge hope. Are you getting requests from patients? Are they starting to ask for it, or do you have the same issue as Dr. Aon that people don't yet know about it? Well, it's 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 coming along, and and there has been sort of an education throughout the nation. From from healthcare workers and, and patients and families and certainly on the internet. So so for, for sure that that is building. Patients are becoming a lot more educated. Mm -hmm. um, understanding the patient journey in this situation though is uh, is quite a remarkable thing because you just have somebody who's been you know really making their their final plans and then all of a sudden you know <laughs> this comes along and everything's changed. So. Um, look, it's not an easy journey. I won't, you know, I would, I wouldn't say that it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's a long staircase. Um, but, but when it works, it works. One last question for those who don't know about CAR-T, how simply is it applied? What does the patient have to do in order to receive it? How long are they in hospital, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So basically it's collecting lymphocytes from any patient. We do that uh, with a procedure called leukophoresis. It's a bit like dialysis, 
so you know we collect billions of of white blood cells and then the cells are shipped off to a, a laboratory uh, outside of the institution often in the states uh, where where the manufacturing happens and the gene transfer happens on those cells to put in this novel kind of synthetic receptor uh, that's very potent at recognizing the cancer cells. The cells come back after about three weeks um, and uh, the patient receives some chemotherapy to make room for these new cells and the cells are infused over about 15 minutes and then goes on from there. They go home. It's so so they stay in hospital. So very bad. The yeah. the side effects from an immune system, if it gets too powerful, you know, the immune system is such a powerful thing. If it if it gets out of control and the chain reaction goes too quickly, patients can become sick, even have to go to the ICU. Okay. So it has to be done carefully. It has to this be is done. Not Magical, yeah. Yeah, no, no. And and the teams, the cell therapy centers that are performing CAR-T have gone through an extensive multidisciplinary setting of the table so that there's education and all the pieces are in place so that uh, there can be no mistakes. The stakes are very high with this and, and, and preparing a cell th therapy center is a big, big part of it. My last question for now is how many centers in Canada are equipped to do CAR-T therapy? Uh, about 13. 13. In all provinces, or is it centered mostly in the bigger centers? It's often centered in places that are doing other types of stem cell transplants okay. that have the infrastructure for that. But I, you know, I think, I think part of it, increasing capacity is looking at other ways to provide this care safely, uh, in, in more, in more centers. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Foley. So now over to Toronto, Dr. Bell. You're listening to the two frontline doctors say what they're seeing. I see you nodding. Uh, what do you think with what you're hearing and what you're seeing? Yeah, thanks, Davis. Thanks for the invitation to come and chat today about this uh, incredibly exciting new area of therapy. You know, Canadians have several assets that actually contribute to the opportunity to to get access to these new therapies that are so important for people who need them. And probably the, no, the most important asset is, of course, the people like Dr. Aon, Dr. Foley, internationally recognized experts in current therapies who have connections, who have their own laboratories where new therapies are being explored, and international connections that allow Canadians to get access. And I'm thinking probably the best example that I remember from the time when I was deputy minister in Ontario, I had that privilege. It was back about 2016 when the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia was starting to treat children with relapsed leukemia with CAR-T therapies. Uh, these were experimental therapies and physicians at the hospital for sick children, hematologists knew the results, these early results from clinical trials that were happening and wanted their patients who had failed remission, failed bone marrow therapy for bone marrow transplant therapy, to get access to this treatment. And they asked the Ministry of Health in Ontario to refer people out of country to Philadelphia and legislation in most provinces prevents us from funding patients to get experimental therapies as this was characterized at the time out of country. Uh, but the flexibility, because of the expertise present at the Hospital for Sick Children, we were able to actually fund the Hospital for Sick Children from the Ministry of Health to develop a collaborative approach that used the laboratory transformation of cells lymphocytes, as Dr. Foley explained so well, the undergo therapy. They made a trip to Philadelphia and then returned to follow-up therapy at sick kids. So most of the treatment was in Toronto, funded by the ministry for this new evolving treatment. But the flexibility that was possible for these children who needed this treatment so desperately was because of the international expertise present at sick kids, as there is one of the reasons that CAR-T was offered so early at McMaster in Hamilton. The Jurovinsky Cancer Center was the expertise that Dr. Foley and his colleagues offered that allowed them to get accreditation to provide this treatment. So that's certainly our biggest asset across the country. 
are the passionately committed clinicians and basic scientists who've been working on cell therapy for some time. So that's a huge asset for us. Right. So is that process, though, that you had to go through to get these kids treated sustainable? We, or are we looking now no, at having not. to create, create a, a nice smooth runway? Because these are coming. This is not optional medication or an approach, is it? You're absolutely right, Avis, and I'm happy to say another asset that we can refer to is CADF, the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Therapies in Health, which has been preparing for this from 2016, 2017, their first reviews of regulatory processes for cell and gene therapy have been developing since that time. They've been writing about it. The uh, CEO of CADF, uh, Suzanne McGurn, who started off working on the provincial side, is well aware of the complexities of federal and provincial regulation, not just to pharmacare. You know, it's a drug agency, a health technology assessment of drugs, but also importantly, therapies in health. And that's probably the best way to characterize cell and gene therapies. It's not just as drugs, although drugs are involved, but mm -hmm. therapies that are complex and that evolve you know, different parts of the healthcare system. So you, you mentioned the new CRISPR therapies of genetically altered cells being reinfused in people who have thalassemia or have sickle cell disease. Well, treatment for these children and adults is pretty well organized in our Canadian healthcare system. So if we look at the situation in Toronto, for example, there are hemoglobinopathy clinics, that is clinics for children and adults who have altered hemoglobin, sickle cell or thalassemia hemoglobin at sick kids and across the street at the Toronto General who've been treating children with these illnesses. And of course, they're linked to the hematology centers at Princess Margaret and at sick kids who are actually providing bone marrow transplant therapy. And it's sort of similar, the CRISPR therapies to bone marrow transplant therapies, as Dr. Foley mentioned. So we're pretty well organized in terms of introduction of these complex diseases or introduction of these complex therapies, because we have a history of treating people in expert centers like I just described. Why do I, I think I hear a but coming. But. Well, you know, the issue of how do we organize our complex federal, provincial, territorial health system into something that deals in a straightforward, as you say, smooth pipeline for introducing these new therapies is tricky. Um, for example, you asked, you know, how often is, how many centers will provide this therapy across Canada? And Dr. Foley mentioned 13 centers for CAR T therapy. If we look at centers that may be introducing CRISPR therapies for hemoglobinopathies or new genetic therapies for uh, other diseases, hemophilia, for example, um, probably there'll only be two centers for these early hemoglobin uh, diseases, or treating hemoglobinopathy diseases, two or one in children perhaps and two in adults. So how do we get patients to the centers that are capable of providing them with care? And crucially, how do we decide on what's a fair price that pharmaceutical companies have worked for years, they've invested billions of dollars in research. How do we ensure that they're getting a fair price for the treatments that they're providing? And that's the one place I'll mention a big but is that Canada is one of the few Western countries that does not yet have a strategy for teaching or treating rare diseases, nor do we have a strategy for how we're going to pay for drugs for rare diseases. And many of these new genetic cell therapies will be characterized as rare diseases when they start up. And how do we figure out is a million dollars for treating a patient with a sickle cell disease I can tell you as an orthopedic surgeon, forget about the cost. If you've treated one patient with a joint crisis from sickle cell disease, you know, whatever the cost, this is gonna be worthwhile. But how do we look at a fair cost? And that, that question is complex and it requires complex negotiations. 
And that's going to be one of the things that people whose kids who want themselves to have access to this therapy are going to be pushing for. How do we get these rare diseases into our system? How do we get treatments for these rare diseases into our system with fair access quickly? Mm. What's your assessment of where Canada stands compared to other countries? You know, I, I think it's hard to say across a broad spectrum of illnesses. I mean, as Dr. Foley's described, um, McMaster Chervinsky Cancer Center started treating patients with uh, relapse lymphoma with CAR T at a fairly early stage of the progression and introduction of these treatments. I, I think that uh, we have a real challenge in that we don't even know how to characterize what a rare disease is in this country. We definitely need to improve Improve access through doing under the new pharmacare policy that's being introduced just last week. We need to reinvigorate the discussion about rare diseases, how we invest in, how we provide contingent pricing examples. For example, if a patient is cured of sickle cell disease, well, there are hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, of saving for the healthcare system. So if it is indeed, as Dr. Foley said, one and done, all those costs are being avoided. On the other hand, if 10 years from now, the therapy stops working, was it fair to have paid for a one and done therapy? So the idea of contingency in mm -hmm. what the real world effects are, what the real world evidence of impact is, is something that's important that we haven't started to talk about in negotiations with how we gain access to these drugs and other therapies. So what is the motivation then that can come to make the discussion happen? Because as you mentioned, one of the interesting points about the one and done, if it doesn't work, I've heard that some jurisdictions are looking at getting their money back if it doesn't well, So work. that's the idea of contingent pricing is that the- Oh, contingent, okay. So the contingent upon the real world evidence of what happens. And this is something that's also a challenge in Canada in that we have 13 provincial territorial health systems. Where do we get the evidence from each health system to ensure that mm -hmm. the real world outcomes that we're seeing for patients are being achieved? And how do we relate that to the payment that we're willing to provide for these uh, brilliant and, uh, and revolutionary therapies? So these are questions that we have to challenge. The uh, CADIS, as mentioned, is certainly providing us with a lot of information in terms of health technology assessment of what this could be and advice around the issue of contingent pricing, pricing based on real world evidence. But we really have to get our act together as a nation in terms of the way we gather information from 13 different health systems and bring it together in a single understanding of what accomplishments are being achieved for patients mm -hmm. in understanding what we're willing to pay as a single national price for a medication. That's a, that's a big one. One last question before we leave you at this point, but um, what, who should take the lead or how do provinces and hospitals, like how, where does the initiative begin to push it yeah. forward? So we're fortunate in that CADIS, the Canadian Drug, Ag or <laughs> Drug Agency for, uh, Canadian Agency for Drug Therapies and Health Assessment is a single agency that gives us information about the international evidence for how things work and advice regarding how they should be paid for. We then have another pan-Canadian organization called the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, PCPA, that takes that kind of evidence or advice and creates a negotiating policy with the companies that are introducing these. And that is a, you know, that is a real economic business negotiation with these new therapies. That's where into the business negotiation needs to be inserted the real world evidence of what the outcomes are from these mm -hmm. new treatments. And mm -hmm. they're being introduced to the stage when they won't even around for two or three years, perhaps. Yeah. And what do, we, what do we say if they're having a huge impact of four or five years or if they're failing to have the same impact that's expected? So these are complex discussions. We do have pan-Canadian uh, structures, CADIF and PCPA, that take the lead on this. And that, that's good for us. That is good. Mm, good. All right. Thanks, Dr. Bell. Back to you, Dr. Ian. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about your struggles, because I know that you've had the good outcomes, but it's taken a lot of work for you to get the okay to use these. Can you explain how much work it's taking and where we should go or any advice you have for people listening uh, yes. and where to go? Yeah, thank yeah. you. And I'd like to follow up on Dr. Bell's comment on the word outcome. And so this is a new era of medicine and choosing the right outcome to link to the pricing is something anyway in our field that we're just learning about. And it's important to say, what is the most critical outcome measure of change that's significant for the patient? you would like to think rather than for the regulatory agency. And that's an evolving field. So from my perspective, uh, the Luxturna, the drug that we're talking about, was approved in the United States in 2017, in Europe in 2018, Health Canada in 2020, the provinces in 2022, in reimbursement only in April of 2023. And this was extremely frustrating because these are progressive forms of vision loss. And by the time reimbursement was approved, some patients were no longer eligible because they weren't enough viable cells. Now, the Health Canada approval in part was delayed by the company. And we have a reputation, and Dr. Bell can correct me if I'm wrong, but that uh, companies don't like to apply to Health Canada because they say we're complicated. And we have new drugs in the pipeline and I'm like, no, 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 apply to Health Canada early. And, and so that's been very frustrating. So we've had to send many, many documents and calls with Health Canada and the same we followed with CADIT and Ines and the PCPA. And, Actually, just to figure out on which door to knock on was a major journey. And uh, luckily, I had the support of the institution mm -hmm. to, to navigate this jungle. And in the institution, uh, because of my questions, we've managed to put together a group that didn't know each other, which was interesting. They were all leaders who didn't know each other, but all played a key role in making it happen. So it was a full-time any... job. <laughs> it was, I bet. Do you have any advice for people listening in on what they can do to get health teams and governments to work together to make this a little more, uh, you know, fluid? I think the together part is the key. And um, so we were in our uh, expertise was not solicited early. Like we've had to go and knock on the doors to say, we have this expertise, we have this scenario, and this is a pressing situation. So, and at the institutional level, uh, what helped me was involving the CEO and our administrative uh, VP, or executive VPs early, and pharmacy. Pharmacy was an incredible support, but you need to approach this from a, a team perspective, the budget managers and and we created the national network also, like to involve colleagues. Can you break it down to a to step-by-step, -step, five things that people watching this need to do if they want to facilitate this? Not work in isolation. And identify who are the key stakeholders. Identify who has the expertise, like Dr. Bell said, like who are the experts that you're going to reach out to? That's imperative. And then figure out what's the major hurdle to make it happen. So usually that's cost. So you need to involve the budget people, the pharmacy people, and, and the hospital people. Um, it's so teamwork. That's the recipe as far as you see it at this point. What would you like to see happen? Top down? Well, I'd like that people take us seriously. Like I find that administrators and uh, physicians, it's like if the administrators look at us as physician as whiners, and they would not take uh, our request uh, seriously. And, and that was uh, a bit frustrating. Like when 
I mean, this drug was approved in Croatia way before it was approved in Canada. And like all my respect to Croatia, but that was very, very frustrating. And visual impairment is a, is a big deal. Yeah. And another hurdle that we face is the identification of eligible patients, and that's through access to genetic testing. So we're privileged in Ontario to have an excellent access to genetic testing, though through major centers, but it wasn't the same uh, throughout Canada. Mm. So Dr. Foley, what are you learning about the system that's needed to get these therapies to more patients? Is there any you know, what would you like to see in the runway? I don't know how complicated it is for you now that you have an established program, but what do you think needs to happen? Um, actually, I just changed my microphone. Can you hear me okay, Avis? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, you know, obviously that's that's a great question. I, you know, I think the solutions are going to be, the solution will be a blend of things that we we put together and we work on. And maybe just some of the little things summated will will help us move along. I would say that the first thing, and you said it early on, is we really need to take stock of what's coming. And um, and uh, Dr. Bell's 100% right. The, um, the health technologies in Canada are superb, and they do a, an amazing job at, at, at a very comprehensive review of the values and the success of these treatments. But you know, are we looking at a, a lineup down the road, <laughs> and then it turns a corner, and you're, <laughs> you know, the, the number of treatments coming? I think we need to get a good sense of that so that so that we can prepare. And with Chris, with CRISPR Cas9, it sort of adds adds to all of that. The second thing I think that we can do as clinicians and through research, especially research in the real world, is become better at selecting the right patients. Can we envision mm -hmm. a day where I said, you know, we talked about 40%, but can we get it to a point where we're choosing 100% correct? So that virtually mm -hmm. every page, we've learned um, things about the system that allow us to get to that point. The other big thing is automation. And, um, you know, right now it takes, I mean, one of the limitations of CAR-T is it takes about two months to get your cells, but are there things we can do to improve the automation? Um, for example, uh, they're now looking at making CAR T cells in two days instead of a, a 12 to 14 day incubation. So all those little things add up. The other thing is, can we create common platforms? In other words, if a, a certain platform for gene therapy works, can you start taking other treatments and kind of plug and play and, and also potentially look, look at costs? So look, the, the solutions for this are gonna come from, you know, a, a, a large group of people, including politicians, institutions, pharma, scientists, clinicians, it's going to be a group effort. But I do think that we, you know, bit by bit, as we focus on little things, a blend of solutions is going to come about. And mm -hmm. uh, we have to understand who's doing what, what are the roles, but you're a hundred percent, right? You said it from the beginning, we got to face this because this it's, is uh, coming. It's like sipping water from a fire hose. It's it's coming in a hurry. And, you know, patients' lives are at stake. Uh, the stakes are incredibly high. And, uh, but I'm confident we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to get it done. Two quick questions for you, Dr. Foley. What's your hope and what's your worry? Well, hope is already there. You know, the, the, the treatment um, is hopeful. The, yeah. Okay. So if you cure somebody, you know, that's, that's hope with a capital H. I mean, that, that's the, that's the big one. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to take a village or a town or it, it's going to take a lot of, a lot of bright people with, with very varying expertise to, to figure this out. But, you know, my hope goes back to the, you know, I marvel at the science. And, you know, it was 1953 when Watson and Crick you know, discovered DNA. A mere 70 years later, you know, we're using yeah. this stuff. It is. Uh, and, and with successful outcomes. I, I mean, you just have to marvel in where science has come. And that's, you know, hats off to a lot of very bright basic scientists, including Canadian basic scientists that yeah. figured this stuff out. I mean, 
you know, our role as end users is important so that it's safe. But, you know, man, there's been some some incredible discoveries and, and that's not going to stop, you know. So true, true. I, I'm very um, helpful. Um, I see questions coming in, but I have a few for Dr. Bell before we go there. Uh, one of the questions I was asked to pose is, is there anything that we did during COVID to bring vaccines, these treatments to people quickly that could be used as a template for getting these newer expensive therapies to people? Yeah, that's a great comment, Avis. First of all, I think we saw that Health Canada has become more nimble in approval of new uh, new types of products. The mRNA vaccine products had been used before. They were quite quick in developing approval processes that responded to the urgency of the situation. I think the other thing that Canadians need to recognize is we're a country of 40 million people spread across a massive geography and multiple health systems, as mentioned. We need to have more pan-Canadian or, goodness gracious, call it federal engagement in understanding the pipeline that's coming, in determining, as Dr. Hayan said, the outcomes of patients. If we've got you know 14 patients across this country being treated with a new therapy. We can't afford to have each health system evaluating the outcomes or reporting them separately. We need to have a pan-Canadian approach to gathering data and integrating data together in a way that allows us to think as a country, not as 13 individual health systems. So that strategy for patients with rare diseases that I mentioned before, I'll mention again, to say that increasingly, Cancer is not one disease. Lymphoma is not one disease. It's multiple diseases based on the genetic challenges posed by the disease. So even fairly common cancers like lymphoma become a set of rare diseases that require separate diagnosis through genomic analysis and separate therapy, depending on what those analyses mm -hmm. show us. And that sub-segments the population of patients in a way that says, we've got to look at this as a population of 40 million people, not as individual provinces and territories. And we have to bring this data together in a more effective way to get the best treatments to people. Mm. Um, that raises the other question about the cost, because we hear a lot in the health system these days, we just don't have the money or there's money being needed out for health for emergencies and things like that. And I can hear that you know, legislators and payers, when they look at one treatment, you know, 3 million, 2 million, that can we afford these? Or do you have to show cost benefit before you go further with it? Uh, you know, big issue aside, yeah. when you have a single yeah. payer, what do you do? It's hard to swallow some of these numbers. Well, you know, the so-called pharmacoeconomic analysis, that's a long term, but it is an important term that organizations like Cadiz and Ines in Quebec provide are essential, and they're based on our willingness to pay. Um, these aren't the big challenges, though. You know, these aren't the challenges that break the healthcare system. The challenges that break the healthcare system are how do we manage the increasing population of frail and cognitively impaired seniors. Those are the big costs, save us. Not how do we treat patients with hemophilia who are gonna be cured of a terrible disease, patients with sickle cell who are gonna be cured of a terrible disease and decrease cost of the system thereafter. That's right. These, I was reading. I was reading that just on the thalassemia one, another blood disorder, that thirty-nine of forty-two patients who got the gene therapy for that never needed another blood cell transfusion for at least a year. So that's got to be a big go. saving, right? Yeah. Your your lips to God's ears, Avis. That is a huge <laughs> savings. For you know, what are we talking about? Forty patients that have been treated so far. I mean, this is a rounding error based on the healthcare costs of what we spend appropriately. And what we need to spend more on, which is treating seniors in a more cost-effective way in our system. Yeah. So we need to think about cost-effectiveness absolutely. Uh, that is the duty of politicians who are elected to look after public funds. And they're absolutely right to say we have to look at cost-effectiveness. Mm -hmm. But we also crucially need political attention to what is our strategy for doing so? How are we looking at the hundreds, if not thousands of new treatments coming? And how are we going to treat small groups of 50 patients across Canada? 
and make sure these people are getting access to the cures they deserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, some questions from people who are watching in. I guess this one goes to Dr. Foley. If CAR-T fails, does it have an effect on the traditional treatments? And I guess the answer is no, because they've already failed the traditional treatments. Is there anything after CAR-T? There is. Oh, so, do you tell. Um... Do you tell. So it's it's a timely question, Avis, because a lot of a lot of new therapies have kind of come into this what we call the third line space for for patients, particularly with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is the one that can be cured. Um, CAR T has the longest sort of track record of of, of seeing the cures because we've been watching them while, as I said, one fellow seven years now. Um, but but there is a similar sort of immune therapy called a bite therapy, and and that's quickly emerging into this space as well. Bit of a different mechanism. It's not gene therapy, but um, uh, so so there are other treatments. Specifically to the question, post CAR T, uh, sometimes there's some residual cytopenias and hematologic toxicity that do make subsequent treatments down the road a challenge, but not impossible. Uh, uh, up until just a few years ago, there, there really was nothing post CAR T, but but things are moving into that space. Mm -hmm. um, another question, I think it would go to you. Um, if someone saved their child's umbilical cord at a private bank, does that fit into this the cell therapies or the gene therapy at all? Well, that's a great question. So. Um, not not at present, not at present. Um, and again, this kind of speaks of, speaks to, like right now, when we're talking about CAR T, it's a patient's own lymphocytes that that we're using. But uh, in an effort to speed up the process for patients, especially for patients who have unstable disease, they are talking about off-shelf CAR Ts and off-shelf mm -hmm. NKT cells. Uh, so that's not the patient's own one. That's something you can take off the shelf and give it. Uh, there would be some additional risks associated with that graft versus host disease and other immune problems. But uh, in terms of the question, it's it, it's a good question. We're we're not there yet, but it's uh, you know it's something for for potentially down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rion, how about this one? How do we loop in the public into all of this discussion? And can you use patient partner community to help? You kind of suggested you're already trying that. Um, and who should lead that public awareness? Is it disease per disease or? Did we lose your audio? I think Elise is muted. Sorry, uh, sorry. You're muted, yeah. Sorry, Avis, yes. So we've been we've been discussing this with Novartis, who is the company uh, who distributes uh, the current gene therapy, in that there needs to be education of the public, but also of various level of eye care providers to optimize uh, patient access. Like rare in rare diseases of the eye, some people don't even realize that you can do genetic testing and identify the precise genetic cause, which plays a key role in the management of patients. So there's room for uh, education, uh, as the person said, using patients, but also various level of eye care providers um, to raise the level of, uh, of awareness. Mm -hmm. That's very important. Is um, okay. Um, one of the other questions is if we were to develop more of these technologies, because they are labor intensive, some of them, um, mm -hmm. and create more Canadian made cell and gene therapies, would that help? Mm -hmm. And is there enough being done? I did see that there was one uh, program uh, set up by one of the agencies in Ottawa to promote this. Are we doing enough to? get Canadian made products and therapies? Um, I don't know about the others, but I don't think it being Canadian made is is the hurdle right now, in part because we're talking of rare diseases. So 
I'm sure Dr. Foley, like me, we're part of an international community and the clinical trials are international. The limiting factor in this being accepted more broadly is the cost, as was mentioned. And if, for example, in Canada, I didn't realize we don't have our own GMP facility like to, to make the, the drugs. And if, it, if that was made uh, in Canada, uh, the cost could be much cheaper. Um, that's the big hurdle right now. But I think that the invention doesn't necessarily need to be made uh, here. There no, there's not enough money in the system for that. Okay. So we're reliant on whatever's happening elsewhere in the world, really. Or here. There's or here. like there's some here. The, the research funding here is is very limited compared to, for example, the United States. Yeah. And it, it's very costly to develop such treatments. Like even Luxterna, even to make it before making it to the phase three, the few centers who involved it must have been at least $40 million before a phase three trial. It's very, hence, very expensive. Hence the big price tag. Um, I think this question would go to you, uh, Dr. Bell, and you've kind of touched on it, but if we don't have enough time or evidence yet for real world data, won't we have to make decisions on these medications or these therapies without evidence? In that case, how do you make the decision? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And I'll go back to what Dr. Aon mentioned earlier, and that is patient outcomes. What's important for patients? Because we're willing to pay a lot of money for things that transform lives. I mean, that's been demonstrated yeah. in the discussions that we've had here today. The question is, do products transform lives? Are they, as Dr. Coley mentioned, one and done? Uh, these are things that can only be understood with real world evidence. We're not great in Canada, uh, con collecting pan-Canadian real-world evidence. We need to be much better at that. And organizations like Cadiz that totally understand this, organizations like Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Art Alliance, which totally understand this, need to engage in discussions about uh, costing and revenue to pharmaceutical companies based on this real-world outcome. That's mm. outcome that's important to patients. If they achieve that, mm full marks, full funding. If they don't achieve that, or if there's you know slippage and relapse in the outcomes that are important, then perhaps the original price that was negotiated gets rebated in some way. There are lots of ways of approaching this, but I agree with whoever the questioner was that said, should we wait to have real world evidence that we can rely on? That's not necessary. We can do this conditional or contingent approach to pharmaceutical pricing. Fantastic. Well, I guess we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you to those who've asked for questions and thank you to all of you. I really hope that those listening in and watching have a real uh, good sense of the excitement around these and why this issue has to be looked at because patients and doctors will be asking for it once they hear about it. Um, so regardless of what happens, uh, this will be a topic. Um, and I just want to thank everyone and uh, pass it over to Matt. Thank you, Avis. Um, and again, just to, to reiterate with what Avis just said, thank you to everybody. Thank you to all our speakers and Avis for running the show today. Um, and thank you for everybody joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And that's it. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.